Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. In today's video, I want to focus on some key pieces of information that new people to boa keeping should know. I think when people start to keep boas, they're kind of overwhelmed by all the information out there. They tend to get distracted and maybe focus on things that don't really matter. They end up going down these rabbit holes that ultimately are not really productive. And in many cases, they don't worry about the things that they really should be worrying about. So today's video, I wanna to just touch on some of these key topics. So if you're new to keeping boas, hopefully this will give you some food for thought to help guide your first six months to a year or so in this wonderful hobby. So what this video is not intended to be is a comprehensive care guide to boas. I've already done many videos on boa care. I did a video entitled Your First Boa, which covers many of the key care points. So I would direct you to that video if you want more information. And also I intend to do a series of beginner videos coming up in the near future. Uh, probably five or six videos dealing with different topics that are important to beginners. And these will be more on actual care topics. But today's video is really more of a tips of things that you should be concerned about when you first start uh, keeping boas. So my first piece of advice to the new boa keepers is to tune out the social media chatter. And what exactly do I mean by this? Because obviously I'm part of social media. The point is that we live in a great age where information is so freely available. And as you're, I'm sure you're aware, there's a plethora of information online in forums, on websites, in chat, chat groups, in you know, YouTube videos like this, and Facebook, etc. There's a lot of people that love to give their opinions. You know, a few of them are really good. Most of them are kind of, eh. and then some of the opinions and interactions are just really, really bad. And I think when beginners go online and they ask questions, um, you know, they mean well, and they're asking a question to them seems, you know, perfectly reasonable. Unfortunately, many of the online, you know, uh, forums and Facebook groups are just not really that welcoming. And, you know, when someone is behind a computer and they're anonymous and there is no repercussions for any of the negative things they say or any kind of, you know, bad behavior, so to speak, they, it's just free range. And I've seen a lot of beginners go on to some of these groups and ask per perfectly reasonable questions and they get this really hostile response or they get information that's just, you know, blatantly wrong or just, you know, a combination of the above. Part of the reason I set up this channel was to give an alternate source of information about boas and, you know, specifically locality boas, keeping and breeding them. Um, in addition to what's available on the other social media outlets. And, you know, I try to be as welcoming and as safe as possible, you know, for lack of a better word. So if you have a question, you don't need to worry about being, you know, ripped apart here or somebody being mean or, you know, giving some kind of a, you know, negative uh, comment about you. Um, I try to answer every single question you guys ask me, either by responding in the comments. Sometimes I have videos where I answer people's questions. So if you do have a question, you know, feel free to ask it here. There's no dumb questions. I'm not gonna attack you. You know, beginners are welcome here. We need beginners to continue this wonderful hobby. And you should feel welcome. This is a great hobby to be in. You know, unfortunately, there's a few bad apples uh, among our ranks, but the vast majority of boa keepers are really friendly and helpful people. So you don't need to worry about that. But, you know, to finish my point, there's no one way to do everything. There are numerous different ways. Sometimes one way will work better for a given person in a given situation than another way. I know I have the way I do things. It's constantly evolving. I'm constantly doing things slightly differently depending on what's working and what isn't. And that's you know part of what I share with you guys on this channel. Uh, so you know if someone tells you there's only one correct substrate, they're just plain wrong. The third tip that I wanna to give to you new beginner boa keepers is don't worry about the exact identity of your boa constrictor. And it might seem kind of strange coming from a guy who promotes pure locality boas like this Tarahimara locality boa that I have in my hand here. But the point, the, the truth is that the majority of boas in the pet trade do not have an exact identity. And by identity, I mean it's locality information or it's breed or pedigree. You know, if you go to a general all-purpose pet store, um, chances are you're gonna get something that they label as a boa constrictor, but it doesn't come with any exact locality information. Often it doesn't come with any exact, you know, morph or, you know, gene, genetic information either. And that's fine. 
Um, you know, sometimes you might get a boa as a rescue that just looks like a boa. You know, we know it's a boa, some kind of boa constrictor. We don't know it's the exact type. And the truth is that these boas out there, uh, you're never really going to know what its exact locality or its exact genetics oh. are. And that's just, you know, it's just something people have to accept. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I want to stress that. These are pet animals. Okay, so you have a boa as a pet. It makes a perfectly fine pet, even if you don't know its exact background or its exact information about its locality or genetics. As I mentioned, the majority of boas in the pet trade do not have an exact locality. So they've either been in captivity for so long that any kind of information about their ancestors, you know, the animals that came from the wild to found that particular line of boas is long gone. Or, you know, boas have changed in captivity as a result of selection in captivity. And the other issue is that many boas have been crossbred. So you have boas that come from multiple different regions which have been crossed into one boa. So they don't really have an exact locality any, anymore. Their locality is actually wherever they're living. So if they're in a, you know, a t uh, living in your house in New York City, it's a New York locality boa. Um, but th this isn't something you need to worry about because the boa will make a perfectly fine pet without knowing its exact locality information. There are certain collectors, you know, myself included, that pride themselves on having a locality specific collection and we trace the bloodlines of our animals and we have pretty good um, information to back up what their actual locality is. But this is the vast minority of boas in the pet trade. Um, so if you buy a boa just from a basic pet store or you adopt one from a humane society, chances are like 95% that it's basically just a some type of a common boa, boa imperator, but it really does not have any locality information at this point. And there's a good chance that it's a mixture of several different localities. I also want to touch on something. People get confused by the term red tail boa. So what exactly does this mean? And you know, I did a whole video on this, so I won't go into too much detail here. But the true definition of red tail boa is a member of the species boa constrictor, subspecies constrictor. Okay, the vast majority of boas at pet stores that are described as red tail boas are actually not red tail boas, or at least not true red tail boas. Most of them are a member of a different species called boa imperator, or the common boa. So at one point, the, you know, boa constrictors were described as just a single species boa constrictor, and there were something like eight or nine different subspecies. About five years ago, the boa constrictor species was subdivided into three different species. We have boa constrictor from South America, we have boa imperator, from southern Mexico and Central America into northern Colombia, and then we have Boa Sigma from the Pacific coast of Mexico. And these are all now considered separate species. For example, this Tarahumar mountain boa is now considered Boa Sigma, although it used to be considered Boa, boa Constrictor Imperator. It was the Imperator subspecies of Boa Constrictor. It's still the same boa. It doesn't really matter what we call them. The boas don't really know the difference anyway. So if you buy a, most boas that you get at a pet store will be some form of boa imperator, the common boa, formerly referred to as boa constrictor imperator. Um, many of them have much of their origin coming from Colombia, the Colombian boa imperator. So these make great pets. You know, they're actually better as pets for most people than the true red tail boa, boa constrictor constrictor. So if you have a boa imperator, you know, be very happy with it. Don't ask people, is this a real red tail? And, you know, somehow thinking that somehow the real red tail, the boa constrictor constrictor is better because it's more expensive or more exclusive or whatever, because it's, you know, a very um, non-productive type of logic to go down. And a lot of people, unfortunately, do. There's a lot of snobbery among boa keepers that think that their boas there are you know somehow better than the common boas but this is just you know utter nonsense so be happy with your pet boa chances are very good it's a boa imperator and it's not a true red tail even if it's been sold to you as a red tail or a Colombian red tail and there's nothing wrong with that and these boas make great pets that you should be perfectly happy with but just don't worry about its locality info and be asking people because odds are pretty good that your boa does not have 
any precise locality at this point. And then a similar situation, people have a boa like that and they think that it somehow has some kind of more for some kind of gene in it, even though it's basically just your normal common boa. So they'll ask about, you know, what morph is my boa or does this boa look like it has some kind of gene? And this is what kind of makes people on these uh, Facebook groups unhappy and sometimes they respond in a you know, pretty nasty way. Um, but again, you should not be worried about your boa because pretty good chance that it's just a common, normal common boa, boa imperator. The fourth tip I want to give to beginning boa keepers is about feeding boas. And there's a lot of chatter online about feeding boas and the correct amount of feed. I've done quite a few videos on this in the past. I'm not going to go into any extreme detail here. But what kind of concerns me is that the majority of people keeping boas are e either feeding way, way, way too much or way, way, way too little. Okay, you can't starve a boa, you also can't stuff it and try to, you know, power feed it into becoming this obese stuffed sausage of a snake. It really comes down to common sense. We want our boas to grow at an appropriate rate, slowly but steadily. And in general, most boas fed appropriately are going to grow anywhere from about 8 inches to about 2 feet per year. In general, I would recommend feeding baby boas anywhere from about every 10 days to 14 days. And then when they get to be a couple years old, you probably turn down the feedings to anywhere from about once every one and a half weeks to about once every three weeks. Adult boas is probably once every two to four weeks. It depends on the bow. It depends on its body condition, how much your, um, what's the size of the meals, if you're gonna breed or not and every bow is different. So don't get obsessed about the exact right feeding schedule. Just look at your bow. It should be growing slowly but steadily. Tune out all these idiots out there that claim they feed their bow three times a week and it's you know a year old and it's now six feet long and eating small pigs. Or these people that are only feeding their bow once every two months because they're you know they're the hardcore reptile keepers. I'm only gonna feed once every two months. It's just nonsense this type of logic. You know, if you're doing that, you're starving your snake and it's never going to be a good breeder if it breeds at all. If you're feeding it too much, your snake is, again, going to be a stuffed sausage, unlikely to live much past maybe 9 or 10 years because of the stress you're putting on its heart. So you want your bows to be nice and lean and muscular, not fat, not skinny. It's really not all that hard, but this is a topic that people just, they just don't get for whatever reason. The next tip I have for beginning boa keepers is don't worry about breeding your boas. So with boa keeping and with reptiles in general, there's always been a lot of focus on breeding them. And this is kind of misplaced. And I think where this came from is way back many decades ago, before these animals were being bred regularly in captivity, there was a need to increase the amount of captive bred offspring just so that uh, we wouldn't deplete the wild animals and we wouldn't need to be reliant on collecting these animals from the wild. But today we have plenty of people breeding these animals and there's no shortage of reptiles for people who want them. Um, so there really isn't this need for everybody to be breeding their animals. Although breeding boas is certainly extremely rewarding, you know, and obviously I breed boas, it's definitely not for everyone and it's a lot more involved than you might think. It's certainly also not a cash cow, and the majority of people who try to make money breeding boas are going to end up losing a lot more than they ever make. So if you get into boas specifically as a money-making venture, that is really a terrible, terrible idea. And there are numerous other ways that it's a lot easier to make money than breeding boas. I often see people that have been keeping boas for, you know, a few months, and they decide that they want to breed them and they put all of this investment and attention into learning how to breed them and getting their, you know, their boa business set up even though they don't even have any babies to sell. I think this is just a really a misplaced effort. And for the first few years of boa keeping, you should really be just focused on learning as much about their husbandry and care as you can and learning all the basic boa techniques. If you do want to breed boas, there's certainly an opportunity a few years down the road to tool up and you know to gear up and get ready for breeding boas. 
Um, you know, most boas aren't, don't reach breeding size anyway until about four or five years. So there's no need for you to have this elaborate plan to breed your boas after you've been keeping them for a few months. It's kind of strange. Can you imagine if somebody went out and got a pet dog and had their dog for all of uh, three months and decided they were going to gear up to breed Rottweilers or whatever their dog was? It just doesn't really make sense. Okay, so there's, there's no need for you to breed boas. If you don't breed boas, you're not really missing out on the hobby all that much. And there are plenty of areas where you can enjoy the hobby without going into boa breeding. I've done a lot of videos talking about perspectives of pros and cons of breeding boas, things like that. Although, as I mentioned, it's extremely rewarding breeding boas. It's also very demanding and it can be a considerable sacrifice. The next tip that I have for beginning boa keepers is be very concerned about certain parasites and diseases that can have a negative impact on your boa's health. Whenever you get a new boa, you should always quarantine it, keep it in a separate room, in a separate enclosure away from any other boas or reptiles in your collection for at least three months, preferably six months. You just want to make sure it's not carrying any of these pathogens. For this video, I'm not going to give an exhaustive review of all the potential parasites and diseases your boa could get, but I do want to mention one, and that is snake mites. And snake mites are the most common parasite out there. They become, you know, just a scourge on reptile keeping. Any major reptile show you go to, guaranteed, probably dozens if not hundreds of animals will be infested with these things. They're everywhere. Um, they get sent in shipments of boas. You know, people buy a snake, they have it in their collection. Sometimes for just a few months, they sell it to someone else. So these parasites are really going around. Snake mites are extremely hardy. Even one single female snake mite can start an infestation through uh, parthenogenesis. Once they're in your collection, they're extremely difficult to eradicate. If you have a large collection and snake mites get in there, it can be an absolute disaster. So these things not only suck your snake's blood and you know deplete its energy, they can also spread diseases and psychologically having them is just torture because they're so small, they're so hard to detect. You can use all kinds of toxins on your collection, all kinds of chemicals trying to get rid of them. You think that they're gone and then a few months later they just keep coming back. It's just horrible. So you want to do everything that you can to prevent the snake mites from getting in your collection. You want to isolate new animals, be 100% sure they don't have these things before you introduce them to the general collection. Believe me, if you get infested with snake mites, uh, you will regret not taking stricter uh, precautions. So please take snake mites and other potential diseases seriously to help safeguard the health of your pet boa. The last tip I have for new beginning boa keepers is an important one, and that is to do your homework before acquiring a new boa. There is a huge amount of information available online in various channels, such as this uh, YouTube channel. There is also a lot of information offline, so be sure to read all this information, have, your, have a pretty good idea how to care for your boa, and have it set up, completely set up, before you get the boa. You shouldn't be relying on the seller or breeder of the boa to give you all the information to care for the boa. This is something you really need to learn for yourself. Um, and again, do this before getting in the boa. I've seen a lot of people get a boa. They don't really know exactly what they're getting into. They're asking a lot of questions after they got the boa that they should have asked beforehand. So don't be one of them. You know, if you're gonna take a new animal into your house, as a, you know, give it a home as a pet, you really need to give it the best possible chance of success, which means researching its husbandry requirements ahead of time and having an optimal setup ready to go before you bring the boa home. In many cases, when a boa pet does not work out for somebody, it's because they didn't research its basic needs ahead of time and they didn't provide its a basic environment with the right temperature and humidity and the animal ends up getting a uh, sick because of some disease that could have been prevented from proper care and husbandry. So please do your homework ahead of time. So anyway, I hope this video was helpful and this will give you some food for thought if you're a new beginning boa keeper. I've made hundreds of videos on various topics of boa keeping, so be sure to check some of them out and hopefully there's a topic that you're 
you've been think, uh, interested in learning about and that might help you with your new boa. And please consider subscribing to the channel for ongoing videos on boa care and breeding. As always, shoot me any questions or comments you have. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.